Did you know that there are five important stages in the formation of a mid-latitude cyclone? In this video, we will be going through the characteristics, the conditions necessary for formation, the stages, as well as the effects and precautionary strategies, as these two topics very often come out as essay questions. Now, these essay questions typically come out for about 8 marks each, and those are a lot of marks. Hi there guys, I am Buddy and today we're going to be looking at mid-latitude cyclones, obviously in preparation for your exam. So let's get started. So first we are looking at the general characteristics of mid-latitude cyclones. So mid-latitude cyclones, also known as temperate or extratropical cyclones, are large weather systems that occur between 30 degrees and 60 degrees latitude in both hemispheres. Now remember, if they do ask you a question, but instead of saying mid-latitude cyclones, they say temperate cyclones. Just know that that is the exact same thing, right? Temperate cyclones is just another name for mid-latitude cyclones. Now, mid-latitude cyclones move from west to east, right? That is known as eastwards or in an easterly direction. So if you are asked in which direction will mid-latitude cyclones move, then your answer should be from west to east. Now at this point we'll go through two very important pieces of information, right? They typically cover a large area, a diameter of about 1000 kilometers, and bring varied weather conditions including cloud cover, strong winds, and precipitation. So they're talking about the diameter, which will be a thousand kilometers, and they are talking about the weather conditions that are associated with mid-latitude cyclones. So mid-latitude cyclones affect South Africa mainly in winter and it generally lasts between 4 to 14 days. Now let's look at the conditions necessary for formation. So our first condition would be warm subtropical air from 30 degrees north and south meets with cold polar air from 90 degrees north and south at the polar front which is located at 60 degrees north and south. So let's look at our diagram as that will help us to understand this point a little bit better. So warm air that is found here, 30 degrees north, will meet with cold air, right, cold polar air, which will come from your 90 degrees north, right? And the warm and cold air will meet here at the polar front, which is located at 60 degrees north. Now this will happen in both hemispheres, so this can occur here in the northern hemisphere, or in the southern hemisphere. So let's look at it in the southern hemisphere, right? Warm subtropical air from 30 degrees south will meet with cold polar air from 90 degrees south and they will both meet at 60 degrees south which is also known as the polar front. Now both air masses move parallel to each other in opposite directions as we can see in the diagram, right? They are moving parallel to each other and in opposite directions. So in the northern hemisphere, your cold polar air will move south and the warm subtropical air will move north. Now there is frictional drag between the air masses and it causes them to interact with each other. Now you may be wondering why will frictional drag occur? Right? What causes it to occur? Right? There are three reasons why it will occur. And now the first reason will be because of a difference in the speed of both air masses. Remember, cold air will be a lot more dense, therefore it will move a lot quicker than your warm air. The second reason why it will occur is because of the uneven surface that they move on. And the third reason would be because of differences in temperature between the surface of land and sea. Now we will look at the stages in the formation of mid-latitude cyclones. So we start off with our first stage, which is the initial stage. Now in this stage, warm, moist, subtropical air meets cold, drier air along a stationary polar front. Remember, a polar front can also be called a stationary front. So just remember that. So in the diagram, we can see the warm, subtropical air will be represented by a red arrow, right? And the cold polar air will be represented by a blue arrow. Now we can see that these two air masses will move parallel to each other in opposite directions right, obviously at the polar front, which is located at 60 degrees south or 60 degrees north. 
the air masses move parallel to each other in opposite directions on both sides of the front, right? This is exactly what I just said now when we were looking at the diagram. The Coriolis force will deflect both the air masses towards the left in the southern hemisphere, which is why they move parallel to each other in opposite directions. Now we look at our second stage, which is known as the wave stage. As we can see in the diagram, there is a cold front and a warm front. And you can obviously see it is in the shape of a wave. Now how do we know which is the warm front and which is the cold front? Because in your exam, it will not be color coded. The warm front will obviously have semicircles along the line. And a cold front will have triangles along the line, right? That's the most simple way that you could remember that. A disturbance along a stationary front creates a wave. Now warm air begins to be uplifted by the cold air because remember warm air is less dense than your cold air and your cold air will move faster than your warm air. A low pressure sensor begins to develop at the point where the cold and warm air masses meet. Now this is the point at which they meet, right? And at that point, a low pressure sensor will begin to develop. Remember in a cyclone, the lowest pressure will be found in the center of the cell. We now look at the third stage, which is the mature stage. Now, if you look at the stage right in the diagram, you can see it forms a V shape. Can you see that? And we can also see two pressure readings right in the center. It's a thousand and two millibars. And then as you go outwards from there, the pressure will then increase and move on to 1004 millibars. So the cyclone intensifies as the cold and warm fronts become more distinct. Can you see they are a lot more distinct in this stage than the previous stage? So the wave deepens into a fully formed V-shape, right? As I've said, you can see it will represent a V-shape. The warm air rises over the cold air and the cyclone becomes more organized, forming an open wave shape. Now this is a very important point, right? Now we are discussing the weather associated with this stage. So this stage is associated with widespread cloud cover, precipitation, and strong winds. Now weather patterns may vary on either side of the front. Remember, because one is a warm front and one is a cold front, they both will bring different weather patterns. We now get on to the fourth stage, which is known as the occlusion stage. Now we are coming towards the end of the life of a mid-latitude cyclone, right? And in this diagram, you can see now there's an occluded front because the cold front has caught up to the warm front, right? And again, we can see that the lowest pressure will be found in the center, and this pressure is 998 millibars. Remember, pressure is recorded in millibars. So the cold front catches up to the warm front, and that is because your cold front has cold air. Cold air is dense, so it will move a lot faster. And this will lift the warm air entirely off the surface. This process creates an occluded front where the warm air is no longer in contact with the ground and the system begins to weaken. Can you see there's an occluded front, right? There are triangles and semicircles. And heavy precipitation can occur at this stage as warm, moist air is forced to rise rapidly. We now get to the last stage, which is the dissipation stage. Now we are right at the end of the life of a mid-latitude cyclone. So as the energy source, which is the temperature contrast, weakens, the warm air is fully lifted and the cyclone loses strength. The system gradually dissipates and the weather conditions improve with fewer clouds and less precipitation. So the impact and the precautionary and management strategies very often come out as essay questions. Now each essay question will come out for about 8 marks and that is a lot of marks, right? If you can score total in that section, then you are starting off on a very strong note, right? So let's look at the positive impacts of mid-latitude cyclones. Now these systems bring rain and snow to many regions, providing essential water for ecosystems agriculture, and human use. In areas prone to dry conditions, the moisture from mid-latitude cyclones can be critical for replenishing soil and water reserves. So just think about this for a second. If you are living in an area that is very dry, right, your water reserves are low, 
the rain that comes from the mid-latitude cyclones will be extremely beneficial not only for you but for farmers. Right? This will help them with their livestock, it will help them with the agriculture and plants. So this water that is brought in the form of rain from a mid-latitude cyclone, it will bring much needed relief to everyone in that area. The precipitation from mid-latitude cyclones helps to nourish soils and support plant growth, which is beneficial for agriculture. The rain carries nutrients into the soil, promoting healthy crops and vegetation. Right, that's just another point supporting the benefit of the rain that is brought with the mid-latitude cyclone. The strong winds and precipitation associated with mid-latitude cyclones can help clear pollutants from the atmosphere, improving air quality. This can be particularly beneficial in urban or industrial areas where air pollution is a concern. So let's say you live near a factory and that factory is constantly pumping out toxic gases into the atmosphere. The strong winds that you'll get from a mid-latitude cyclone will help to blow those toxins away and you will then have clean, fresh air to breathe. In colder regions, mid-latitude cyclones contribute to snowfall, which leads to snowpack accumulation. The snow melts during warmer months, providing a critical water source for rivers and communities downstream. Remember, once snow melts, it will become water, and that water will then run off into rivers and also fill up dams. So that's a huge positive impact, right? We now look at the negative impact, right? If you look at the diagram on the left, we can see there's flooding, there's hazardous ocean conditions, there's soil erosion, as well as damage to your cattle because of snow. The heavy rainfall associated with mid-latitude cyclones can lead to flash flooding or river floods, particularly in low-lying or poorly drained areas. This can cause significant damage to homes, roads, and farmland, displacing people and disrupting communities. Remember, floods can damage your home, can damage all your furniture. People can even drown because of this flooding. Prolonged storms, flooding and extreme cold associated with mid-latitude cyclones can cause significant damage to crops and livestock. Heavy rains may lead to waterlogging and snow or ice can harm crops. Livestock may also be affected by severe weather conditions and freezing temperatures. Remember, certain animals are not used to these cold temperatures. And once they are exposed to this, they can die. And that will cause a massive loss to farmers and the community. Soil erosion occurs from the heavy rains and will damage the environment. Mid-latitude cyclones create rough seas characterized by large waves, strong winds and dangerous currents. These conditions can be hazardous for ships and maritime operations, leading to the capsizing of smaller vessels and delays of ships, affecting global shipping and supply chains. Increased risk of accidents, particularly in fishing and transport industries. These storms can also endanger the lives of sailors and fishermen, requiring them to avoid affected areas or seek shelter. Now, a lot of people rely on fishing right, to bring in an income for them and their families. And if there are hazardous conditions out at sea, they won't be able to go there because obviously their boat can capsize and they will lose their lives. So the hazardous conditions out at sea will be a very negative impact. Now we will look at the precautionary and management strategies, right? Obviously, these can also be asked in an essay form. And you would have to give eight strategies and obviously explain each strategy. So today I'm going to be giving you nine as that will definitely give you more than enough, right? And they all are simple, so they are easy to remember. So our first strategy is, houses should not be built in low-lying areas as they will be affected by floods. Can you see it's simple, easy to remember? The second strategy, an efficient drainage system should be implemented in urban areas as this will reduce the risks of flooding. Strategy three, Sheep and other livestock must be placed in a kraal or shed in order to keep them safe. Number four, farmers should keep sufficient feed for the livestock in order to avoid livestock losses. Number five, always monitor weather patterns and conditions before going on any outdoor adventures. Now, 
outdoor adventures, they're not only referring to hiking, they're also referring to activities that can be as simple as going to the store. Right? That can be dangerous if there's a mid-latitude cyclone coming. Strategy six, remain indoors during hazardous conditions. So if you see there are large gray clouds, if you see there's heavy winds, then please remain indoors. Number seven, stock up on all essentials such as batteries, food, and medication. Number eight, building and maintaining sea walls, levees, and storm surge barriers in vulnerable coastal areas can help protect against flooding and storm surges. Now, number nine, identifying and zoning high-risk flood areas can prevent construction in vulnerable regions and reduce potential damage. Properties in flood zones may require elevated foundations or other flood-proofing measures. So those are basically all nine. Um, Like I said, you are welcome to take a screenshot and write them down in a book and constantly go over them each and every single day. So when you get to your exam, you automatically remember all nine and you can easily write it down in the form of an essay. I want to thank you guys so much for watching, especially if you made it this far to the end. It shows that you are committed to doing well and I applaud you for that, right? If you found that this video was useful, if you've learned something, then please give it a like. And if you want more videos like this, then please subscribe as I will be posting a lot more over the next few weeks. Now, if you are writing your exams soon, I want to wish you all the best. Trust in your preparation and I know you will do well. Always remember to take a break from studying. As I would say, taking a break is almost just as important as studying, right? You don't want to study every single day, every minute of the day and burn out. And the day that you're writing an exam, you're going to find it very hard to remember everything. So take a break, you know, put the screen away, go out for a walk, go out with your friends. So just relax, right? relax in an outdoor area. And then when you're feeling refreshed, come back to the books and continue learning. So yeah, all the best. Take care, guys. God bless you. And yeah, I'm out.